So thank you everybody and welcome. And of course, welcome to our speaker today, Marana Ebrahimi, who uh, I'm very excited to be welcoming. Before we start, I would just like to uh, remind us that York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. Um, and as I read this acknowledgement, I would I recognize that we are also having a virtual meeting. And so I would like you to also reflect on the land that you are currently residing on, which may not be where York is situated. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It's now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. And we would like to acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region that we find ourselves on. It is uh, with great pleasure that I am introducing you today to Narane Ebrahimi, who is the author of Women, Art, and Literature in the Iranian Diaspora and Assistant Professor of English at York, where she teaches courses on diaspora and world literature. I think very timely today, she's going to be speaking about Stories That Save Lives, the boom of Iranian refugee memoirs. I'm sorry that we are not having this meeting today in person and that it's virtual, but I am delighted to welcome Narane here today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michaela. I want to say hello to everybody present here today and uh, greetings. Um, we are having this talk exactly during the uprising uh, in Iran, um, this um, revolution at the um, hands of um, women and also supported by all parts of the society, just reminded me of a poem by Farooq Farooqzad, you know, the beloved Iranian poet who died so early at the age of 33 by an accident. And she said, I want to rise up and say, no, no, no. You know? And uh, this idea that we see Iran has risen up and said no to tyranny, uh, said no to injustice, to um, forced um, obligations. Um, and to uh, treatments that are unequal um, in society. Um, the, this talk was envisioned before the uprising. Um, however, we see that uh, there, are, there are parallels and similarities that we could see um, are happening right now. I'll share screen with you. Um, or maybe before I share screen, I can give you a little bit of a background about myself and what I do at York. So I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English as Michaela so kindly introduced me. And um, I joined um, York in 2020 at the height of the pandemic. So I haven't met many of my colleagues, unfortunately. So a lot of unfamiliar faces. And um, so communities such as this that bring like-minded people together are so vital in these virtual times. Um, to keep us together and create a sort of a shared community of witness. Um, so I wrote my first book on um, Iranian diasporic um, works of art and literature um, in um, 2019. So women, art and literature in the Iranian diaspora. And what am I arguing here? Because I come from the Department of Humanity, Languages, Literature. Then I'm dealing with concepts that are political, social, and so this interdisciplinary approach, right before the talk, I was talking to Michaela about this cement walls between the disciplines and faculties and how there is not much of a connect. Whereas uh, if I want to study the memoirs written by the refugees, I cannot isolate that from the political circumstances of the country, from the historical. And this is something that's not so welcome. Unfortunately, um, not that in the department, in the Department of English it is welcome, but when I apply for grants, uh, so the close reading of a poem maybe by Shakespeare would be more welcome than a, than a memoir written from the camp on the scraps of paper and um, kind of collected, translated through the work of enablers and um, having reached us. Uh, so we don't even have the tools um, 
uh, from uh, maybe from that side to interview the authors, work with them closely. Um, however, we do have really strong techniques and tools and the, uh, theories in order to do a close reading of the work itself. So what I'm calling here maybe is a for more interdisciplinary approaches um, and uh, collaborations between people who work in different departments, sociology, psychology, literature, humanities, political science, all of that. And maybe this is an older approach to university that we have lost nowadays because of all these compartmentalizations. Um, so that was the first book, and uh, my and uh, maybe the <clears throat> if I could shortly give you uh, the main concepts that I discuss. So it's the relationship between aesthetics and politics and ethics. So I have this trio <clears throat> as a source of a Borromean knot. A Borromean knot is if you cut these three circles interlocked, you cut one, the whole assembly becomes disassemb disassembled, disassembled. So so aesthetics, ethics, and politics work together. And what I mean by that is not a work of art that has an overt political message, but I'm arguing along with Jacques Rancière, you know, that um, just like politics, art takes up space and it's audible. So we hear and we see people acting on stage. And he compares this to politicians. They take up space. We are there listen to. So those who have the power to take up space and have that audibility and visibility, they occupy the space of politics. So it could be from the arts, it could be a theater performance, it doesn't necessarily have to have a political message, but it's overt. It's not overtly political, but it's in, in its fabric. Aesthetics, the study of the beautiful, the study of the what is uh, related to our senses, the arts, they are connected with politics and they could affect change in the society, in the landscape of what is possible to change. So that was the main tenure of the, the first book. And the second book is mostly focused on, on refugee autobiographies, refugee memoirs. And as you know, a memoir used to be considered a quotation marks of feminine genre. It used to be associated with what women do, and it uh, wasn't a very masculine inside quotation marks again. Autobiography, which was written by the political figures, which was written by um, white old men, to put it uh, bluntly. So, um, so, but nowadays we see that memoirs have pushed other sorts of genres off the shelves, and they are becoming bestsellers. People are interested in the lived experience of others. And who are these others? Sometimes we project our worst fears and fantasies upon others. However, we can find them in ourselves as well. So this fascination with the other and also the fear of the other go hand in hand sometimes. And the people such as Viet Tan Nguyen have talked about this hypervisibility of the other, we can say slash refugees slash you know, asylum seekers. So this hypervisibility in the news and the invisibility in the public space. And so that we are not talking on par with them. We are either afraid of them or ignoring them, asking them to blend into our society. Okay, so with that little introduction, I wanna, um, I wanna delve into the talk today, which is based on the, my second uh, monograph, which is still in the works. Uh, on autobiographies and memoirs written by the refugee and how stories have become sometimes more important than food and medicine for the displaced. They save lives in ways that maybe um, those, not that they are not important food and medicine, but they can be more crucial sometimes. And human rights at its heart is a matter of storytelling. Um, let me share my screen with you for the PowerPoint. So I, I, what I've seen is that there's a boom where there's a, um, you can see the PowerPoint, right? No, not. Yes. Yes. No? yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, there's a boom in the production of um, and writing of memoirs 
by the displaced, by the forcibly displaced, by the refugees. And uh, I'm not going to be talking about all of the works that are being produced. There are so many, uh, but some of the most prominent ones maybe are here. No Friends But the Mountains, written by Behruz Bucharni from the camp in which he was imprisoned illegally for over six years. I know that we have had Bucharni here speak at CRS, and maybe we are going to have him again to see what he's thinking about the current events, um, the Kurdish situation and all of that. But it's interesting that when we are talking about stories that save lives and the situation of Bouchani and what happened to him, it's very maybe timely. The Ungrateful Refugee by Dina Nayeri. And Dina, uh, her mother was a convert to Christianity in Iran. She was um, harassed and she decided to leave with her young child, Dina, and her brother. And, so she came to the U.S. and under this pressure and guilt of having to show gratitude, perform gratitude, she says, I am grateful. But at every dinner, my mother had to get up and tell the horrendous story of how we escaped Iran and how we have found all that there is, all this riches in the U.S. However, Nobody wants to know all the, nobody wants to hear all the challenges we faced here in the US, all the um, racism, all the ostracization. Uh, my mother was a physician in Iran and when she came to the US, she had this thick accent and she had to work in a factory and they, she was ridiculed for her accent. They thought she's stupid, they thought she's slow. So she never had a better job you know, than the one she started with in the US. And Dina, as a young daughter, she had she was under this impression that she has to prove her worth because she no, she's no longer a refugee. She's an American citizen. So she has to prove herself. And so she goes to Yale and she just hoards all these degrees to, in order to say, I, I am worth um, this token that you've given me. But then revisiting this, she feels like, why do I have to have this guilt that, um, that I am, um, I have gained asylum. Why, um, why should I perform my gratitude? And um, maybe this request is too much. When a lot of the unrest has been caused by the Western world, and so taking in a, a few refugees comparatively is no great feat. Um, so that's an interesting and provocative title, and Dina is very eloquently, um, she talks about this uh, journey, and she also goes back on a genealogical journey, and we see a lot of former refugees doing that, going back to the camps, going back to where they came from to see what happened, because the traumatic shock is so great that sometimes makes memory murky, and um, always uh, begs the question of, what exactly happened and who am I? How did I end up here? Uh, know Your Place, very recently published by Golris Kahraman. She is the first refugee to become a member of parliament in New Zealand. And she's currently in the Green Party. She wrote this book, very, very interesting. Again, a child refugee. She had a very easy journey to asylum. She just boarded a plane and they landed in uh, New Zealand. We know that this doesn't happen anymore. And, they were able to gain asylum on this spot. And she knows this. She studied law. She lived in Africa many years in order to help others who weren't as advantaged and as um, lucky as she was. Um, but again, although she was raised in New Zealand, she's a member of parliament. She one ch full chapter of the book towards the end is about all the stigmatization that she faces, both because she's a refugee, a woman of color, and um, She's considered to be a Muslim woman, although that's not how she identifies herself. So, so there's that as well. Even for those who gain political power, they are still stigmatized. Another one that came out recently, I mean, 2014, Manane Estani's um, uh, Metamorphosis, an Iranian metamorphosis about his own journey, which is a bit different. And he got caught up in Iranian politics he actually produced a comics that was offensive to a um, minority group in Iran. So there was an uprising in the country. And um, he claims that he did it inadvertently and he didn't mean to uh, offend um, the minority group, which is not a minority. Actually, the Azari population in Iran are very, a very large 
uh, portion uh, percentage of the Iranian population. Anyhow, so he produced his comics and then the Iranian government kind of scapegoat him because the protests, as we see it right now, it's not just about one thing. For example, the protests in Iran are about how women are being forced to confirm. Uh, but there are about many other things as well, how there is inflation, how there is not enough jobs, how the oil money and revenue is being stolen from the people and it's going to the pockets of a few. So there are many demands in a protest and people are just waiting for, for a spark to take to the street and take down the government. Same thing happened in the, the early 2000s about Mana's uh, comics. So the Iranian government said, oh, he's to blame. They put him in jail. He had to finally goes out on parole and he escapes the country. But his problems kind of continue and to follow him. So he talks about how difficult it is and how his problems don't stop when he gains asylum. And that's what something that is shared among many of the refugees that their problems don't uh, stop when asylum is gained. <laughs> Excuse me. So what do they do? Um, we see that a lot of them in the memoirs, there is this need to tell the story. Um, I have this quote by Freud that the voice of the intellect, and some people have translated as the voice of the unconscious is a soft one, a feeble one, but it does not rest until it has gained a hearing. So they're, they're story, they are storytellers, if not by nature, they are by need, by necessity, they want to tell this story. And we know that, um, the survivors tell stories that the sympathizer want to hear, and that's a quote by Achebe. And the reason is that um, this process of telling a story and hearing it are intermingled without a receptive audience. They are incapable of telling their stories. And we know that these stories are so crucial, so important, because human rights at its heart is a matter of telling stories. And I have this quote that you can look at. I don't know if the little thumbnail is blocking it. Um, so many of the most recognizable organizations that intervene in humanitarian crisis do so in large part by using language instead of food and medicine or weapons. The most important act of rescue for them is not delivering supplies, but asking questions, evaluating answers, and pleading with those of us who observe from a distance. So those of us who observe from a distance have this advantage. We have this critical distance. We can see what's going on. We feel it. But at the same time, we can think about it rationally, too. So we sometimes, the Iranian diaspora, feel the guilt of you know, the survivor guilt. And here, I cannot help, and they are over there. So, so we do have this sense of guilt and this burden of responsibility that we can't uh, we can't shoulder sometimes. But the uh, the word responsibility is the ability to give a response, and uh, we do have that ability, and that response can be given in many forms. And one of them is just hearing and receiving these stories. Um, and although the activists would argue with me and say that that's not enough, and maybe that's not enough, but as Gayatri Spivak says, an education in humanity is, it might not create a revolution, but without this revolutionary change of mind, revolutions could fail. Um, so what, what she is referring to is that a revolution in the mind is also as important or maybe a precedent to a revolution in society. And that's what the work of people like me in the humanities is. But I do always welcome working, collaborating with people in social sciences, political science, sciences in order to do an effort, like have a kind of a grassroots approach that both listens to these narratives, receives them, and at the same time has power to change policy. This is a beautiful photograph by a photojournalist, Fabio Bucciarelli. <clears throat> he has this whole collection of photos that he took uh, from refugees' lives. And this one is at the shore of Lesbos. And you, you see the fear, but at the same time, you know, this, this sense of the child is looking toward the horizon. Is it a better one? That's the question that we can ask. So maybe I'll stop share right now. 
<clears throat> I do have more quotations, but I don't want to read directly from them. Um, so how do refugee memoirs differ, differ from other source of life writing and what are at stakes? Because we know that asylum is granted upon these stories, these truth claims. In literature, we have the idea that even fiction can have truth claims in it. You can understand the experience of a person, even if the work is fictive, through going through the journey of the, of the story with the author. So this, this very dichotomy between fact and fiction, it's different from a humanitarian discipline as opposed to one from the legal discourse. And um, so can stories save lives? Well, we can look at the case of Behruz, Behruz Buchani. Um, so he wrote his memoir from the camp in 2019. He won international recognition, hundreds of thousands of dollars of award money, maybe near a million. While the author was still incarcerated without access to a bank account or even a proper internet, so No Friends But the Mountain, writing from Manus Prison, was composed over the six years of his detention in this case processing center he calls a prison. And it was built for people who reach Australia by boat called the Wet Feet. And the Wet Feet are prohibited from entering the country forever. And so they are sent to these third countries in the ocean, um, like Papua New Guinea and others, and they're, li they're living in camps. So he thumbed his uh, novel one text at a time on a smuggled phone uh, called this WhatsApp memoir because he sent it on WhatsApp to his friends across the world because he was a journalist, because he had access maybe to these modes of narrative production, which are so crucial in gaining a sense of power and agency. He kind of painstakingly weaves together this community of witness that we were talking about around the world. And he enables his freedom they help him uh, enable his freedom and close that camp. But of course, we know that with over 90 million refugees and displaced people in the world, there are so many other camps still open. <laughs> so that was one example of how stories, maybe he was a journalist in Iran. He had access to different journals uh, and uh, newspapers across the world that he would report from the camp. He had a translator, Omid Tofiqian, who was who was an academic. He's an academic. He's a philosopher, and he kind of took up his case and kind of brought him outside. And in and in uh, and in I can't pronounce today, but uh, but a lot of other authors don't, and they don't gain that sort of recognition and freedom. For example, one of them is. Uh, Manan Estani, he's known in the Iranian community as a cartoonist, but um, no, not a lot of people are familiar with the, with the horrendous escape that he had to do, with all the imprisonment that he had to face, not just in Iran, but while trying to gain asylum. So why is one uh, memoir more recognized than the other? What are the roles of the translators, the enablers, the helpers, and um, what catches this source of international imagination? Um, these are important questions that uh, can be looked into, but for the purpose of this short talk, I'm going to be looking at maybe the more general concepts that we can discuss. Uh, this um, writing life stories is an empowering act of subject formation. These are important things to remember. In the face of all the mechanisms of discipline and control that the governments have built to objectify, to shun, and to ignore the existence of millions of forcibly displaced people. A refugee narrative subverts the systematic silencing of, of the asylum seekers, and they bring these intimate stories of injustice to the free world by fortifying a social bond that eventually envisions that community of witness. These apparently natural acts of personal storytelling they requalify the foreclosed space of the refugee camp and transform it into an active, aesthetic, political locus for change. That's what I mean by foreclosed space of the refugee camp. So uh, maybe Freud again talks about foreclosure as this process where something that's unpleasant is completely blocked off from the consciousness. So, but what, what happens when we block off something completely? It haunts our nightmares and it 
intervenes in our reality. So once if a people are foreclosed and completely ignored and shunned, they will have that return of the repress. Um, so what Freud says that happens after foreclosure is a hallucinatory confusion. And that's what we see maybe in political um, discourse nowadays that there is halluc hallucinatory confusion about the people that they have imprisoned themselves, they have the power to help and they don't. Um, so yeah, it can bring visibility. And I, although they have been hyper visible, the refugees in, in the news and there is a sensationalism about them, how menacing they are. And the, but on the other side, we see the literary connotations of individual ref refugee stories. They haven't been fully explored at all. We have images of alarming swarms of women and children in media of immediate rescue in the news media, which has what, ha what it has done, images that are hard to digest, images that are heartbreaking, they do not necessarily create the result that we want. It does not immediately translate to a sense of guilt and a call to action. So what it can do is that just, can create an averted gaze. And that's what Rancir talks about. The intolerable image can create an averted gaze. It can desensitize people. So what we need, so what happens is that instead of those maybe, um, this is sob stories, real life experiences of people in narratives in a memoir, they kind of change and kind of they, they subvert that desensitization that the news media has created. And that's through the power of art, the art of storytelling, which is a forgotten art nowadays. So they have des desensitized people to the dilemma of those forcibly displaced people. Migrants are pictured as homogenous, silent masses. And these are numbing images. They're made with the averted gaze in the age of compassion, fatigue, and overstimulation. On the other hand, the legal discourse wants to hear only trauma survivors' stories as it fits their own narrative frames of reference. And these references change with every country. So they have different sets of laws and legal systems, different politics and cultures of affection and hospitality and trust. And um, we can see that memoirs kind of go above these imaginary geographies and borders. And they incite a source of a political change that can drive maybe international attention to the condition of these bare human lives. So what do they do? They are denied the space of the asylum. The many, many authors create this space for themselves through their writing. As a response to a ban, Refugees iterate and reclaim their personhood through their autobiographical acts to create a sanctuary in space and an asylum in time. And this is a quote from Philippe Lejeune, an asylum in space and an archive in time. So they take up the space where the space was denied to them, the space reserved for the political subject. The political subject is the one who says no and express the census. And we know consensus, that's the situation when everybody says yes, everybody nods and everybody agrees. That's the example par, par excellence of dictatorship. And we need the census, we need no sayers. We need different voices um, uh, in a democracy. And that's a sign of a democracy where the census is accepted when the naysayers aren't shunned and shot and ridiculed, or seen as enemies or suppressed. Um, so the, the authors can say no, can say no to the hospitality they receive, the systems they go through, um, to the tokens they receive, and they do that. And reworking Lejeune's argument, Dylan Whitlock asserts that writing from the camp produces a chronicle of the occupation, a performative space where the diary narratives enables a visceral and intimate account. So, we have dehistoricization. We have a systematic erasure. But what refugee stories do? They create an asylum in space and time for the downtrodden of the earth. 
And it's their, their writings is a call for humanity to wake up from this hallucinatory confusion that believe benevolent uh, states are looking after those at risk. So authors reclaim their personhood uh, through their autobiographical acts. And instead of succumbing to invisibility in society or hypervisibility in the media, their narratives become soft weapons or soft artilleries. Um, so there is more to this talk, but since I'm running out of my voice, I'll let, um, maybe is it okay if we stop here and let's ha have a group discussion? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That was, I, I was taking notes through the whole thing. There are all these little comments and, and, and phrases and thoughts. Um, I wanted to, before I, I ask anything, I wanted to first draw your attention to a quote by uh, Adorno that was put up by uh, Anahita Yousefi. And I wanted to know if anybody had any questions. I have, I have lots of thoughts, but I'd like to open the floor. Well, that's a beautiful quote. Thank you, Anahita, for sharing. I'll just take a minute to look at it. But in the meantime, please feel free to unmute yourselves. And if you have a comment, you can give it. If you have a thought, even about not just the talk about the current events, I mean, this is a safe space where we can discuss it. Sorry, a quick question. If we're doing a discussion, would you like me to stop recording? I think that's fine, yes. Yes.